Local stories, local people. We're taking you inside Western Mass News. It's the Even Better Western Mass Podcast with Dave Madsen. Good to have you with us for this week's edition of the Even Better Western Mass Podcast. Welcome to May. We made it. Let's face it, uh, pretty much all of March and all of April, a blur to all of us, but at least there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Wherever you are, I hope you're doing well and staying healthy, and we all do know here in Massachusetts, the stay-at-home advisory continues until at least May the 18th. Let's get to today's program. In this week's edition of Even Better, you're going to hear from Sarah Giovanna Calabrese, the Resource Development Director of the Boys and Girls Club of West Springfield, about a program they've put in place to support local businesses and families impacted by COVID-19. My first guest, though, is well-known political consultant Tony Signoli. Tony is the president of the A.L. Signoli Company, a public relations, political, and governmental affairs company that he founded back in 1992. The company itself serves political and corporate clients all across America. Tony, a veteran of over 400 political campaigns, including presidential, prime minister, and parliament campaigns in other countries, and many referendums in Massachusetts and throughout New England. Tony has counseled governors, congressional, district attorney, and sheriff and mayoral races in 21 states. Tony and I talked about the possible impact of COVID-19 on the race for president, Congress, and some local races. What do you think heading into this election season, the impact this, the coronavirus and, uh, and the stay at home is going to have on what we've already seen uh, yeah. as far as municipal elections and, and one state Senate race and impact? Yeah, well, certainly, you know, as you mentioned, that Senate race, we're probably thinking about the second Hamden Hampshire, you know, John Velas versus uh, Michael Kane, I believe. Uh, forgive me if I've got his first name incorrect, but, but Kane versus Velas. And to see that having to have been pushed off to a safer moment, safer time, or to give a little bit more time in 11 cities and towns in that Senate district to figure out how do we do this safely? That's interesting on the, on the local level. We get to see that firsthand up close. But there's the bigger implications right now. Throughout America, every state legislature is up for re-election. Every member of the House and the Senate in Massachusetts is up for re-election. Certainly there are a lot of United States Senate and gubernatorial races and congressional House races as well. But here at home, what's the immediate impact, Dave? A lot of incumbents are safer than they've ever been before because what challenger can raise up a significant challenge or put together a significant enough campaign doing the things that a challenger needs to do? The hands-on politics, the door knocking, the events, the standouts, et cetera. It's become almost impossible right now to legitimately strongly challenge an incumbent in the House or in the Senate or almost in any seat. Everything changes overnight. Another better, more direct answer to what you just asked you, what else has changed immediately? Fundraising. How do you fundraise at a time like this? That's today what I've spent most of my time on, 17 different uh, uh, clients, 17 different campaigns, advising them of how they do ask for money if they even do it. If we're representing an incumbent somewhere right now, even if they're challenged, we do that in a very, very careful way if we still have to ask for money, anticipating that we're going to have an August campaign or that we're going to need to be up on television or, or electronic media, social media, et cetera. Anything else we have to pay for, print, radio, et cetera. It's got to be done the right way. If that incumbent is unchallenged right now, we're telling them there's no fundraising. If anything, encourage your donors. Encourage those people who are so good to give you $5 or $500 to consider instead to give that to a, a charity in, in the district, You know, something district-specific for the House District or the Senate District. Those are the immediate things we're saying right now. How do you raise money? How do you ask? When there's so much need, where people are having difficulty right now paying their own bills, that becomes, those are the two immediate things. The power of incumbency has become more powerful and more prevalent, and then the aspect of raising money. How do you do that? Now, you look at the race for uh, Congress in, in the first district, Richard Neal being challenged by Alex Morse. Um, it, at this point in time, uh, that, that campaign, I was talking to the congressman the other day, everything's on hold. Yeah. You know, to a degree, it definitely is on hold, the politics of it. But for both candidates, Neil certainly for re-election, as chairman of Ways and Means, he's in the public eye, and he always has been. You know, he's always around. I don't think there's been a weekend in the time that he's been a member of Congress where you didn't see Neil back at home for something. That's one of the things he's noted for. He's not one of the folks that's there, you know, seven days a week and just stays there. He'll always be home for events uh, throughout the district. So as much as he was on people's minds before, as much as he was out and about and involved, even more so now, because he's returning home with even more checks, returning home with even more 
uh, aspects of, of things that he can do as a chairman of Ways and Means, or just as a member of Congress, this congressperson for the first CD, to bring things to fire departments, police departments, municipal officials. So he's got that power of incumbency. For Morse, it was relatively quiet for a while as C-19 hit. And then with the Polio Soldiers Home, with that tragedy that occurred there, and the fact that he was one of the individuals who was able to you know, go to the media, go to the state and say, something's happening here. That put him out in the spotlight yet again. But what we're seeing right now is a mayor in the city of Holyoke who's active, who's doing things as a mayor. But then you're seeing Neil, chairman of Ways and Means, arguably one of the authors of the CARE Act. Uh, he is at the helm and involved in anything and everything that's important to people in his district and throughout the nation. So you're right. The, Campaigns change greatly. You're not going to see the in-person debates. You're not going to see the big town halls. You're not going to see the big rallies or anything like that. Uh, but what you are going to see is both trying to do everything they possibly can to get out there and gain and earn as much earned media as possible. This is a time, and especially I think in this congressional district, as we look at the media outlets throughout the entire congressional district, from Pittsfield to Springfield to Holyoke, as we look at print and TV and all the changes that are occurring, the challenges for local media right now financially because of C-19 and just in general because of the onslaught and the competition of the internet. It's which of one of these two candidates or any candidates anywhere can best utilize and use that local media to get their message out to folks that are paying attention because they're reading a newspaper, watching evening news, listening to the radio in the morning or the afternoon and paying attention on the net too. And we look at the presidential race, uh, you know, obviously, as, as we stand right now, Joe Biden is uh, will be the Democratic nominee for president. Uh, he's hunkered down in the basement of his home in Maryland and and doing his campaigning from there. Yeah. As we look at this in the long run, um, you, you wonder if this is just going to change the dynamic of every campaign from here on out. I think very much so. Right now, consultants that I'm speaking to, whether Republican or Democrat, uh, in, at any level of play, too, as I say, from state legislature to gubernatorial, they're all rethinking their game plan. A good consultant, a good campaign, you've got a game plan well put together before you even announce for the seat that you're running for. You know what you're going to do. You know what your numbers have to be. Normally, we're able to look at polling and surveys to tell us how effective that strategy has been to this point. Right now, there's nothing we can really look at other than favorability polls. We're not able to see what's the impact of our our uh, last debate, what's the impact of our last rally, uh, et cetera. It's a whole brand new ball game. And you'll see that continue to change, especially as the realities of this virus hit home, uh, especially here in the Northeast state where it's much more hard hitting than anywhere else. You look now at, uh, at Joe Biden saying that he's yeah. going to choose a woman for his vice presidential nominee. Uh, I mean, you, you've worked on so many yeah. campaigns. Do you think at this point in time he's looking at that and going, uh, you know, I never looked at Andrew Cuomo. And I mean, there's been so many rumblings about yeah. what, what could happen. Uh, well, if, if there is a convention yeah. and, and what, a, what a pick he would make. Cause I, th- now this is from my standpoint, sure. I could be very wrong on yeah. this, but I look at it that, I, I wonder if people look at Joe Biden and say, all right, even more crucial this time around for Joe Biden is who he picks for vice president, because there's a good chance he'll only be a one-term president because of his age. Absolutely. That factor is there. It's there for Democrats. It's there for independents and Republicans that he may help to try to pull over. When you look at the swing states, it's not the top, you know, fourth or fifth thing that people are thinking about is vice presidential nominee, but it will be much more so as the election gets closer. Because certainly if he makes a pick that's not palatable, that isn't super poll and uh, politically savvy and palatable, that's going to be a problem. He can't afford to have a a Palin mistake, as McCain may have had. Uh, You've got to pick someone that America is going to take a look at right now and believe can be the president of the United States. I know Joe Biden. He's in incredible physical shape at 77 years old. Frankly, he's probably in better shape than I am. He's got a couple decades on me. But on the flip side of that, he's got to pick someone who can do that fundamental job of a vice president. And who knows that better than Joe Biden, having been a good pick for Barack Obama. You don't need to just balance the ticket. You also need to be able to play that role of attack dog, that pit bull position. That person is going to be able to go out on point, on attack, day after day. So the presidential nominee, the presidential side of the ticket, that candidate, Biden, and look above some of the fray. In that regard, he's got to pick someone who's got some chops, who's been out there, 
who's been through the fray, who's won some elections, and who's got some politically, political savvy, who doesn't just have to wait for her advisors to tell her what's politically sound or what sounds good, but they know that instinct has to be there. One thing I do know, and I don't pretend to have an inside on Biden, I was very, very close to one of his advisors, Larry Rasky, who passed away about three weeks ago from coronavirus. Rasky would have been the toughest advisor around the vice president, someone who had been with him since early on, a close personal friend of his son, Bo, and a close personal friend to, to Biden from the Senate on. Rasky would have been the one who would be saying, whoever it is that we pick, they've got to be someone who's got that instinct. They've got to have the ability politically, because as you campaign, so shall you govern. And in that regard, Dave, that's something that the electorate believes. They don't, they probably can't give you that, that verbiage on it. They probably wouldn't respond in that way to say, as you govern or as you campaign, so you will govern. But they do look at that VP or that presidential candidate's campaign, and they consider how you're running your campaign is how you're going to run the nation. And a great example of that is 2016's presidential, where Donald Trump was successful, you had a pretty good idea of what we were going to see. It's been a long reality show in that regard. But that is what the electorate voted for and knew would be the case. With Biden, you know, he's got to pick somebody who, as I say, not only balances the ticket, can deliver an essential or several essential states and swing states. So his decision is a very tough one, very. Now, as we look at, at the race, um, uh, President Trump, uh, many believe that he's using these afternoon news conferences as, as a substitute for the rallies that he would normally have. Uh, but obviously, uh, some things have come back to, to, to bite him in the last few weeks, uh, some of the comments he made. Uh, the, the impact uh, in, in your mind, Tony, on what this COVID-19 and the response to it will have on the race for president? It's huge. You know, there's the perfunctory thing that you'll hear from a lot of consultants. And as I'm saying this, I'm thinking of Joe Napolitan. I'm thinking of James Carville. And I'm even thinking on the other side of the aisle, Carl Rove. They all believed something. Tragedy, catastrophe, bad news, always bad for an incumbent. The incumbent always gets blamed when the electorate is hard hit by something. Whether that's, a, a, you know, a, an act of God, uh, an act of science, whatever it is you always take the blame initially. The initial hit is there. The, the, the standard for President Trump to have to meet at this time is almost impossible. Uh, and folks will judge, you know, what's happened with the economy, what's happened with healthcare overall. All these issues become tantamount upon the electorate's mind. And they wonder, they're seeing what's being done right now. They're seeing, they're seeing how the Trump White House, how Washington is handling this. And if they don't like it, it becomes easy for them to start to consider, would anyone else be better? Does that open the door even more so for a Joe Biden? Does it get you past any you know, negative feelings or concerns you might have had about Biden or a potential running mate or about Democrats? If you're an independent voter who often will tip to the Republican side, if in doubt, uh, this is going to be something that the electorate will weigh heavily. If you're a farmer in Wisconsin, if you're a single mom in San Diego, uh, if you're, you know, someone with a small business in Florida, right now you're weighing this all out by how it's impacting you, your employees, your family, and you afford to pay the orthodontist bill this month, let alone pay the rent. How it hits folks in their pockets, in their wallets, and in their hearts, that's what will move this election. Not to sound corny, Dave, I mentioned Carville. And remember Carville's great line in the Clinton campaign, it's the economy, stupid. Well, that's kind of what it still is right now. It's the economy, but it's the coronavirus economy. Ball and that was the whole thing. I think uh, Trump was basing his whole campaign up until probably mid-February on jobs and, and the stock market and the, uh, the overall economy. And all of that just dumped. Yeah. Perception or reality, whether you think that Donald Trump was responsible for what was a good economy for most folks in the United States, uh, the perception, the reality now is if, you, if the president had taken that ownership, had taken claim to that, laid claim to all that, now, by rote, he loses that opportunity. He loses that, that mantle, so to speak, or that armor walking into this election. We're seeing it now in polls, where two, three weeks ago, I was surprised at how tight it still was but between Biden and Trump. But now you're starting to watch it move for the first time towards a double digit. Certainly, that can all change. Biden can stumble. Something can go wrong. Trump could have an epiphany. There could be something incredible that happens uh, with the economy. But this is such a tenuous tightrope right now for the 
Trump team. And it's something that's got them very nervous. Their hope, Dave, overall, is the superior dollars that they've got. They have got a bankroll that's stunning. They eclipse the vice president's campaign coffers greatly. And in fact, they even eclipse most of the outside or organizations or groups that would be helping Biden right now. They certainly eclipse the Democratic National Committee, uh, et cetera. The money is still there on the Trump side of the ledger. And this is basically going, sounds like it's going to be a fall campaign, no matter what you're running for. I think so, very much so. Everything's cumulative. As Walt Whitman said, there's no great, there's no small. Everything now counts. But the big moments, the big moves, the big passes on the field, they're going to come a little later on right now. What we're also finding, Dave, is that the attention span of the American electorate was stressed to begin with before coronavirus. You know, we had gotten to a point where uh, in a lot of the television commercials that we'll oversee or put together, normally often, you know, in a scientific sense, poll driven, we're trying to figure out how to get messages across the electorate. We've gone. I mean, one of the toughest things I've had to do is to explain to a member of Congress, I hear you and I want to do a minute commercial. I want to do a 30 minute message. But, me, but, uh, but Congressman, gosh, golly, gee whiz, the attention span is gone. I've got to break this down into 15 second messages because everything is so fast. The competition right now, Dave, across all those, those, those uh, network, all those channels on cable, all the other noise, all the other opportunities to go and get uh, uh, entertainment or to get news. It's just so great that getting the message across has become so much more difficult. And I think that's going to be one of the problems right now. We are trying to ascertain what does the electorate have an appetite to even hear from some of our elected officials or candidates who are challenging incumbents? And how much time do we get before they tune us right out? We know that the day of the two-minute mega commercial, so to speak, or even the great five minute that you might have seen in presidentials at some point, those are gone now. Well, then you, lo you look at this and, and the fact that as far as what folks are interested in right now, they're, interested, they're worried about their health and they're yeah. worried about their wallets. Um, you know, how, how far out? I, I mean, I suppose as far as a campaign is concerned, you're not going to be able to gauge exactly how you're going to be able to do things until we know where we're going with this coronavirus, how long the, the shutdowns will last. Yeah. Very much so. And it's uh, a situation that's geographic as well, too. It depends on where you are in the country. Yeah. There are different views of this, obviously, in different states, as we're seeing right now in red states and in blue states, how they're reacting to it, what their governors are doing, how their governors are responding, and what the local electorates are thinking. The mindset in Massachusetts is very different than it is in Louisiana or in Tennessee. So there's no cookie-cutter campaigns for us this time around. Everything has to be customized specifically to the specific campaign. We have never polled so much as we are right now. That's one industry that's doing well through all of this. And it's not just for our political clients, but for our corporate clients as well, because we need to know for them what electorates, what residents, what states are thinking. We need to know for those corporate clients what's on the minds of the people that they sell products to or in the, on the minds of communities where you know, they are in the manufacturing business. So we can then say to their elected officials, Here's the folks in your Senate district, your House district are thinking, and here's how it impacts our manufacturing business and why we need to try to get open or why we need to stay closed longer. Tony, we look at um, some of the governors in this. Many have risen to the occasion. I, I no. want to say, say uh, Andrew Cuomo and, and, and Charlie Baker. Uh, others no. have stumbled. Um, and, and again, I think as you as you as you mentioned too, as far as the, you know, presidents are concerned and how they deal in times of crisis, it sounds like the same thing with many of these governors too. Very much so. My goodness, DeSantis in Florida, almost foolish, almost off the wall, insane with some of the decisions that he's made. But certainly, the lack of transparency for him is that for him, a very pro Donald Trump, very very uh, pro Trump re-election type of a governor. It's trans, it's, it's, you, you see that that's where he's coming from. He wants to do what's going to please the president. He wants to do what's going to be supportive of the president. Your job as governor is to protect and take care of the people, the businesses, the economy, the health care, and on and on and on, schools within your state. So I don't think he's really been thinking that way. You make the obvious on Andrew Cuomo. I've known this governor for a long time. I knew his father actually better than I know him. And it's interesting. This is the, 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 the third coming, as we're calling it, of Andrew Cuomo, you know, from his initial uh, days as secretary of uh, uh, HUD uh, to, uh, you know, running for governor. He had a rock'em sock'em image as the governor of New York, a guy who didn't hold back. And you either loved him or you hated him. 
-hmm. But now this kind of hands-on uh, leadership, this kind of hand-on gubernatorial uh, day by day at the front of the fight kind of a demeanor that has kind of made a lot of us think about his dad, not just because he sounds like him and looks like him, but he's deliberative, he's definitive, very much like Mario Cuomo was. It's called to mind for a lot of us that Cuomo was in a position at one point to run for president of the United States. Polling was there, money was there, everything was there. But one of those rare elected officials who sat back and said, can I really do the job? Do I really want to do the job? I think I'm gonna take a pass. Maybe there's somebody who's better. We don't see that in the, this, this day and age anymore. And with some of these governors, you can see that they're really thinking about their electorates. In Michigan, uh, in, as an example, in Maryland, a Republican governor, uh, Governor Hogan, who has flown in the face, certainly of Donald Trump politically on a few things, but also you know, a very different view than some of his Republican counterparts. Texas, as I think of the question that you asked me, gosh, golly gee whiz, the governor of Texas and some of his thoughts and his comments on this, well, we gosh, gee, we didn't know that that the that the coronavirus could be conveyed this way, you know, et cetera. But where were you for the two months, you know, <laughs> beforehand, where arguably I think my six-year-old godson could have told us this, you know, this, these basics. So some of it's just amazing. And maybe the other part of your question, I better try to answer too. People will remember this. Uh, several key political consultants over the course of time always remind the rest of us in the game. Never underestimate the electorate. On occasion, they'll do something crazy. On occasion, they'll make a mistake. On occasion, they'll put someone that shouldn't be in office in office. But the bottom line, the majority of the time, they see through the BS. They know what's real. They know who's good for them or who's bad for them. And right now, you're talking life and death issues and certainly economic issues that are life and death, too, for a lot of small businesses and corporations in America. Now, we've seen some cooperation uh, in Washington between Republicans and Democrats and all of this, but in spite of that, there seems to be that, that great divide that has been there for so long. At a time like this, this literally is America under attack, and as the president would say, by this invisible enemy, if there's anything that should bring us together, that should bring the House and the Senate, the Republicans and the Democrats together, you would think this would be that moment. Is it more difficult for the members of the House and the Senate for Congress to understand this? Because it's not a terrorist attack, because we don't see two towers burning and collapsing, because we don't see an attack on a USS call, because we can't see it. Mm. Is that one of the reasons that, that we're seeing what we're seeing right now? It makes no sense. It really doesn't. Uh, it, you know, it's interesting, too, as we look at some of the members of the House and the Senate who are challenged right now for re-election. We have thought for sure over the course of the last couple of weeks, again, looking at polling and, and what we're seeing, uh, that they would find some ways to back off on the harsh partisan, uh, rock'em, sock'em, tough politics. And we've seen almost just the opposite. So much of that is so often focused on the leaders, that Pelosi and Schumer on one side perhaps are holding some Democrats' feet to the fire that certainly it's the president who's taken on or taken over the Republican Party, and he's holding Republicans' feet to the fire. But what we really see a lot here is that a lot of this is Mitch McConnell. He is a, uh, Mitch McConnell, forgive me, a more powerful player than a lot of folks realized. The way that he controls the purse strings for so many members of the United States Senate, and even in some instances where they ha he has gotten uh, good enough strategically to be able to get key senators of his to be able to ride hard, very, very hard on Republican members of the House, where those senators are able to reach out to Republican House members within their district, and even in other districts, to say, you're not going to get A, B, and C, and D that you need for your district, that you need for your schools, that you need for your hospitals, or that you might need for re-election to look good, unless you're in sync with where Leader McConnell wants to be right now. It's, it's amazing the power that he has, Dave, very much so. But it is unfortunate. You would think if there was anything that it would be this, this number of us, more people, as we're speaking right now, more people dead, more people have succumbed to this than died in the Vietnam War. Yeah. You think that this would bring these two sides together. It's shocking that it's not. Shocking. And he faces and a strong too. It is a shame. It, it, and he faces a strong challenge in, in his home state of Kentucky, too. He does. And it's uh, Amy Granger running against him. Very, very capable former United States Air Force uh, uh, officer and pilot, a very capable campaign. And what we're seeing there is it's not just a traditional Kentucky campaign. There are people from across America who are contributing to her. 
And of course, to be fair to McConnell, there are people across America and even outside of the United States who are contributing to him through one pack or another or through different venues. So this is gonna be a big money campaign. In fact, before that one is said and done, it will almost look at the expenditure that we used to see in a presidential, even in the 90s, that, that many millions of dollars. Do you really think, and I, you alluded to this uh, earlier uh, as we were talking about it, that, that we're not, we're not going to know what direction these campaigns all across the country are going to take until we know where we're headed with the coronavirus? In, in many ways, yes. Any good consultant, any good campaign is sitting down and strategizing. We've got our worst case scenarios. What do we do if the entire electorate is going out and voting by, by email or going out and voting by mail? You know, this is still up in the air. Massachusetts, a great example. The House and the Senate debating different bills as to how people will be able to vote this year or even register to vote. Um, we're blessed perhaps in Massachusetts to have a legislature that will weigh these kinds of options and not leave it all just to one person, put it all on the shoulders of the Secretary of State, who certainly in Massachusetts is quite capable given the time that he's been there and the other challenges that he's faced in an election sense in, in many different elections. But we don't know. A good campaign right now is planning out any and every possible strategy or scenario. As again, as to whether or not all of a sudden, miraculously, things go back to normal in a month, or whether, gosh, golly, gee whiz, this is the norm into September and November. You know, Tony, I guess the other part of that, too, is say the majority of the country does go to mail-in ballots, uh, the impact that would have on the number of people who would vote as opposed to those who wouldn't go to the polls. Exactly, exactly. There are going to be a lot of folks, no matter what is done in every state, who are going to be afraid to go to the polls, who are going to be afraid to go and walk into the same voting, you know, booth, let's say, that somebody, that, that, that another hundred people have already been in. How do you protect? Will they believe that a, that a mask and gloves are enough? Will they believe that somebody disinfecting that booth after the person before them is that, that that's enough? There's going to be a fear factor out there, Dave. There's no question about it. You know, we've always been able to vote by mail, absentee ballot. The United States military has voted by mail since World War II, during World War II, and since uh, thereafter. It's not impossible to pull off. You know, there are some theories out there right now that one of the reasons that the United States Post Office at this time is in such uh, duress as to whether their funding will be there in the next few weeks or not to be able to continue on is that if they were removed from the equation, how do you vote by mail? That's kind of far-fetched. That's, that's far-fetched even for the... Uh, 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 the folks that would come up with such political thoughts at this time. But the bottom line, if there were ever a case to be made for the United States Postal Service, this sure as heck is one of them. We've done some polling. As much as people you know, might complain about the post office on occasion, when it comes down to trust in an American institution at this time, it's pretty high. And it's kind of like the old congressional thing. I mean, I like Congress, but I like my congressperson. Same about the mail thing. I like my local South Hadley, Southwick, you know, West Springfield little uh, post office, and I love the person that delivers the mail to me every day. That's somebody I can count on. And there's a perception there that's good. That may be one of the things that might help us to actually work at some point. My thanks to Tony Signoli for his insight onto what we may expect as we head into the 2020 election season. My next guest this week on Even Better is Sarah Giovanna Calabrese. Sarah's the Resource Development Director for the Boys and Girls Club in West Springfield. She and I talk about the community gift card giving program that the club has started to support local businesses and families who've been impacted by COVID-19. We also talk about COVID-19's impact on the club now and as we head into the summer. Uh, let, let's talk about this community gift card giving program that you've established, uh, why you established it, and what it's all about. Okay, so, you know, in the early days of the COVID-19 information coming out, we looked at our mission, and a shortened version of our mission is literally to help those who need us most. Now, traditionally, that has meant, you know, our club families, our club youth, but now, that's much different. Now, helping those who need us most, that means helping the community as a whole. So we looked at that mission and we said, okay, who needs us most right now? We know our club families need us, you know, desperately right now. We know members of the community need us now. And we know local businesses are also suffering, are also going through some hardships. So we said, what can we do to support our families and individuals in the community who are, you know, maybe either disadvantaged or going through some hard times 
and help these local businesses. And that's how the community gift card giving program was born. So we're asking individuals in the community to support local businesses, restaurants, for example, or a grocery store, uh, go and purchase a gift card. So you're doing, you're going that extra mile to just help them a little bit more financially and then donate that gift card to the West Springfield Boys and Girls Club where we take that gift card and we'll give it to a family who needs that service the most. That's amazing. How's the response been? It's been great so far. It has been great. It's growing. It's wonderful. I am so, so grateful and thankful for so many people that have been donating. There's a couple different ways to get involved in this program. So, of course, you can pick up a gift card and mail it to the Boys and Girls Club. But for people that aren't able to obtain a gift card, they are still helping out. And they're doing that through our GoFundMe page. So people are making very generous monetary donations. Of course, any size donation matters, but the response has been wonderful and the campaign is growing. Um, we're at you know, $3,680 right now in gift cards and donations. So it's just wonderful to see that. It's almost like folks at home are looking for any way they can possibly help. It's like, if you give them a reason to help, they're gonna help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's just been wonderful. I mean, we've had many of our um, valuable donors come and help out at this time. But the great thing is, is seeing people that, you know, haven't been connected to the club in the past. And now they're stepping up and saying, wow, okay, we, we love what you're doing. We want to help you. We want to help, you know, deliver upon your mesh mission. So it's just wonderful to see new faces helping out. And it's just a program that's bringing the entire community together. And, you know, that just makes us so happy. I guess instead of people coming to the club itself, the club is coming to them. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. I'm going to take that, Dave. All right. That, you, <laughs> <laughs> you have my complete permission. Uh, okay. So, so, Sarah, how, how uh, we talked about how people can donate. Um, now, how, if people want to take advantage of this, if they, if they need help, how can they, uh, how, how can they get in touch with you and take advantage of the program? That's a great question. So right now we are regularly surveying our members and finding out what their needs are. So we want to know, you know, is your family in need of snacks? Are you in need of dinner? Are you in need of hygiene, you know, products? Are you in need of cleaning pro um, products? Do you need lawn care services or plumbing repairs, anything of that nature? So we know what our club families need. So we are also open for weekly snack and activity kit distribution. So during those times, our members can come and also express their needs in person, but that's also open to the community too. So any community members that are stopping by the club to grab these activity kits or a snack for their family members, we're encouraging individuals, please voice your concerns. Let us know what you need because we're going to do everything in our power to help you. That's exactly why our club is here. That's exactly what our mission has been for more than a hundred years. So we're just going to do everything possible. And we want people to know that. So this all fits within the mission. And it sounds like uh, the Boys and Girls Club is needed now more than ever. Exactly. Exactly. Needed more now than ever. I mean, we're not open for in-person programming. But again, we've, we've looked at that and we've said, okay, what can we do to help some of these families that are stuck at home and, and their lives have been flipped upside down, you know, not having the opportunity to go to school or childcare services. So we launched virtual programming as well too. So we're just doing everything we can with the resources that we have to give normalcy to families that, that really need it. Sure, let's talk about that virtual programming. What's that all about? Virtual programming is awesome because it gives our members the opportunity to see their staff that they miss so much. And our staff in return also miss the youth, you know, incredibly. So it gives our members the opportunity to log on to our website or follow our YouTube channel and they can hear messages from our, you know, wonderful staff members and our staff members give, you know, constant uh, activities for the kids, whether it's, you know, STEAM-based learning, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, or, you know, active programming. 
So it's a fun way to kind of keep in contact from a distance, obviously, with our members. And anyone can log on and grab an activity from our virtual page. Sarah, do you think that, that some of these programs that, that were developed in, in really a time of crisis will continue uh, after we kind of get back to normal, whatever that normal is? I think so. I mean, I think that it's important for youth to always keep learning outside of the club, outside of school. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think parents are starting to put more of a value on their time with their children and you know, kids are doing things, they're playing outside more, you know, I think that that is going to be more normal for them, and they're going to be doing more hands-on things with their siblings and family members, and I think it will continue, yeah. Sarah, as, as we look beyond this, and, uh, you know, eventually, uh, you know, I think when we do get back to normal, there are still going to be some different things in place. Have you looked at the possible long-term impact on the Boys and Girls Club of West Springfield and, uh, and, and possible changes in future programs, say, like summer camp? Yes, I mean, summer camp is huge for us. I mean, we have 160 kids, you know, every single day at the club. Um, and that's not to mention the staff that we have too. I mean, we have a, a giant uh, staff that we bring aboard too on summer camp. So it, I think that is going to look a little bit different this year. But the good thing is, is that we are already putting programming in place for summer camp. So we're constantly monitoring, you know, what the CDC is saying, uh, what the, you know, Massachusetts, you know, S Department of Public Health is saying. We're looking at Boys and Girls Club of America to see what they're doing for their summer camp programs. And we're going to, you know, make necessary adjustments as more news comes out. I mean, we, as of right now, we're still going to do a summer camp. You know, I can't say exactly what that's going to look like. But, you know, we're going to we're going to do everything we can to make it happen. So hopefully, you know, we can get some youth in here, you know, maybe the group sizes might be a little bit smaller, but, you know, the learning will go on. And, you know, statistically speaking, children have a summer learning loss, you know, if they're not, if they're not constantly exercising their, their yeah. brain and their muscles. So we recognize that that's huge. And we just want everyone to just keep mentally sharp and keep our members moving. And we're going to do everything we can, you know. And that's even more vital this year, given the fact that uh, I know while there is at, at home learning right now, but uh, the kids have been out of school for half of March, April, May, and, and June. Right. I know. So it's just, I, it's just crazy. I mean, you know, one day we think, okay, you know, we're, we're ready to open for programming and then something else just happens and we're just being pushed back, but we're learning how to mold with that, with those changes. So a work in progress. It is a work in progress, but we're <laughs> keeping a positive attitude every day and we're just moving and pushing along like we do. Fact is, is you're not alone. And I think the other part of it is you learn of things that you can do in times of crisis that you, before you probably thought weren't possible. I know. I think it's amazing to see not just what our club is doing and our community is doing, but what the world is doing to get so creative during these tough times. I mean, that's such a huge light in, within this dark tunnel. I love seeing that, how people are just getting creative to communicate with one another. And, you know, creativity goes on. And one of the things you touched on, too, is, is families are spending more time with their children. I guess if there's any one real positive about this, it's bringing families together, forcing them together, but uh, they're enjoying it. It is forcing them together. And, you know, I think that was a little bit scary in the beginning because, you know, maybe parents didn't know what to do with their youth. But now there are so many resources out there, like our virtual programming, where they can incorporate that into, into their household and into their daily schedule. So Sarah, if someone's uh, interested in the community gift card giving program or, or just the Boys and Girls Club itself and the programs being offered, what can they do? Well, so if you wanna learn more about the gift card giving program, you can go on our website, which is wsbgclub.org. 
and on the home page you'll see a website graphic for the community gift card giving program so if you click into that you can learn more information about how to donate and how to get involved um, other than that we are posting updates regularly on social media so you can follow us there you can also get in touch with us via our newsletter so you can keep up to date with what we have going on here and any new announcements and of course you know you can always call the club um, you can email me so my email information is up on our website as well too and you know again we're just encouraging people please get in touch with us let us know what you and your family needs and we're going to do everything we can to help you out my thanks to Sarah for taking the time to be with me for this week's edition of Even Better. Now, if you'd like more information about the community gift card giving program or the programs and services offered by the Boys and Girls Club of West Springfield, you can go to their website. It's wsbgclub.org. Remember last week on Even Better, I uh, featured a video from The Daily Show where host Trevor Noah highlighted Bay State Medical Center and their Code Rocky. Code Rocky began on one of Bay State Medical Center's care units as a way for caregivers to recognize and celebrate the recovery and discharge of a COVID-19 patient, along with uh, lots of cheers from the staff there and, of course, the theme song from the movie Rocky playing in the background. Well, recently, the Bay State Health family gathered for a heartfelt show of love to Megan Moomjian as she left for home after spending 29 days in the hospital, including time in the critical care unit, fighting for her life after contracting COVID-19. Take a look.
I get goosebumps every time I've watched that video. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm Dave Matson. Thanks for watching or listening to this week's edition of Even Better Western Mass. Hope you stay well, you stay home, and if you can, join me next week.